Okay, we're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and we're going to finish the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, and we'll begin in verse number 16, and um, we have been studying, preaching through the book of 1 Corinthians, and uh, this message has to do with respect for the church respect for the house of God and uh, so let's read this in 1st Corinthians chapter 3 beginning in verse 16 know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you if any man defile the temple of God him shall God destroy for the temple of God is holy which temple ye are let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the foolishness of this world, uh, wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. Therefore, let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ and Christ is God. Now I want you to notice in verse 22 the context of this passage. You remember that he started off in chapter 1 uh, and he started mentioning 13 things that the children of God, a church, has in common. And so they are, you know, and then he went into that and had uh, talked about divisions in the church. And uh, he was simply saying, after all these things you have in common, you're nitpicking, you're just, uh, um, you know, all these divisions over preachers, and personalities, and so that's what the, the, the context is. Notice in verse 22, Paul or Apollos or Cephas, and he, so he's mentioning that. That's the things they mean, the ones that I am of a Paul, ones that I am of Apollos, ones that I am uh, of Cephas, and they were all following their favorite preacher, and it was causing divisions in the church. So you won't understand the passage unless you understand the context. And he's talking about divisions in the church, schisms in the body of Christ. The local church is what he's talking about. Now notice in verse 16 and 17, he's going to tell us about respect for the temple. Let me give you another verse in 1 Timothy 3.15. says, If I tarry long that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, notice that, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so he talks about, he calls it the house of God. He said it is the church of the living God. And he's talking about being respectful and knowing how to behave yourself in the house of God. And so we find here that we've come to a place in America and really around the world where the church is no longer respected. Preachers are no longer respected. I remember when there was a day when you could go and somebody found out you were a pastor and all of a sudden they became very respectful. They became very, very um you know, if they were cussing, they'd quit cussing, and if they were doing something wrong, they'd quit doing it. You know, even I remember when I was in high school and got saved and, uh, and had the opportunity to uh, take one of the chapel services, so then the whole high school knew I was saved, and, uh, you know, the boys would be gathered around, they'd be doing something and talking about things they shouldn't talk about and telling dirty jokes, and I could just walk up, and they'd just get real quiet. There is respect for the house of God. There is respect for the preacher. But we've lost that today. We've come to a place where there is no respect for the church. There used to be. It could be that some churches have brought that on themselves. Uh, there's many um, the, you Pentecostal charlatans who 
want their money and talk about, you know, God, you know, lay your hand on the radio and God will bless you. And if you'll send me a love offering, God will bless you. And they're getting blessed. They were driving around. Now they're flying around in these million-dollar airplanes and going all over the world and supposedly preaching and helping and healing people and all that. Uh, but that's what brings reproach in the name of God. Now notice there's respect for what it is. He called it the pillar and ground of truth. Truth is everything. Yet the Bible tells us that in the last days there'd be heresies, there would be false doctrines preached. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So if somebody's preaching the truth, the church is to be the pillar and ground of truth, it means that they're preaching Jesus. You remember that Paul said earlier in this uh, chapter, in chapter 2 actually, he said, I would have not no one, anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. That was his message. That was his focus. That was what he preached everywhere he went because he knew that Jesus was the only way and that he was the truth. And Jesus himself said, the truth shall set you free. So if the truth is not preached, people are not going to be saved. Christ is not going to be exalted. And they will not be freed from their sin and death and hell until they hear the truth. That's why it's so important to hear the truth. The word truth is found 109 times in the New Testament. That's a lot. Considering 27 books, it's found 109 times. That's about four times in every book of the New Testament on an average. And so there ought to be respect for what it is. It is the church of the living God. It is the pillar and the ground of truth. Notice also that there ought to be respect for because of whom it belongs to. He said it is the church of the living God. He's talking about the local church. He's talking about Middle Creek Baptist Church. And the Bible says that Christ purchased the church. He paid for the church with his own blood. He loved the church, the Bible says, and gave himself for it. And so there ought to be respect because this church belongs to the Lord Jesus Christ. It is the church of the living God. It's not a dead God that we serve. It's not some temple that we go to and burn candles to a dead uh, Buddhist or a dead uh, Shinto or some other kind of false god. We come here and every Sunday is a celebration of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we meet on the Lord's Day in the Old Testament. They met on Saturday, the Sabbath. There was a day of rest. You work all day and then you get rest. And then, uh, but the opposite, on Sunday you rest first. That means you get saved first and then the rest of the week you serve the Lord and put forth your works. And so it's respect for what it is, the pillar and ground of truth, the church of the living God. It is respect because to whom it belongs. It belongs to God. We are not our own. We have been bought with a price. And when God's people come together, we come together as the body of Christ, as the church of the living God. There ought to be respect for the temple of God. Notice, secondly, he pronounces retribution, that's judgment, for troublemakers. In 1 Corinthians 3.17, If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. Now notice that probably a lot of people read this, they think of 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 19, where he said, Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which you have of God. You're not your own. You've been bought with a price. But in the context of this passage, he's not talking about the, the body as the temple. He's talking about the church as the temple. And when we come together, we are uh, indwelled by the Spirit of God. And therefore, when we come together, we represent God's temple. His temple, his church is holy. And it matters to God who, uh, how we treat the church. 
I remember uh, a story a, a fellow told me about a man who uh, he smoked and he'd always go out front and stand and smoke. And the pastor said, listen, if you're going to smoke, go back behind the church or something, you know. And um, he, uh, he got mad at the preacher. That was on a Sunday night. Preacher didn't didn't rebuke him, didn't tell him he couldn't. He said, just don't be out there on the front steps. Everybody, you know, come and drive it in, and the kids see you, and everybody else sees you, and it's a bad testimony for the church. And so he got upset. He got mad, and after church that night, he was going. He was a salesman, a traveling salesman, went to a motel, and um, he, he started smoking, fell asleep, and it caught the room on fire. And he burned up in that room. I remember when I was in Parkersburg, West Virginia. I was pastoring the Pleasant View Baptist Church. And uh, there was a lady named Mrs. Miller. She was only one that opposed me. And um, they, they got a petition to have me voted out. And uh, so I handled the situation. But... She was, um, she got sick just a little bit later after that. She went to the hospital. They gave her some kind of medication that actually she had a bad reaction to, and it sort of fried her brain till she didn't know really much at all who she was or couldn't remember anything. I remember walking down the sidewalk and uh, walking this way and, I saw her and her daughter walking toward me, and I thought at first, oh, no, here we go. She's going to light into me, you know, right here on the street and everything. But we got close, and I could tell she didn't recognize me. And her daughter said to her, uh, Mama, you remember Pastor Seahorn? She said, no, I don't remember him at all. And, and listen, I'm telling you, God takes this stuff serious. When we disrespect the pastor, you disrespect the church. When you disrespect the church, notice what God says. If any man defiles the temple of God, he's talking about these divisions in the church, people who are troublemakers. And he says that God shall destroy, for the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. And so we understand that they are causing problems in the church. They're causing problems. Um... You know, in the house of God, and God does not take kindly to that. Notice thirdly in 1 Corinthians 18, there is a rejection of wisdom. First of all, there ought to be respect for the church. There is going to be retribution or judgment. That's a, just another word for judgment upon those who cause trouble. And now there uh, is a rejection of wisdom. That is, the world's wisdom. In verse 18, notice what it says, If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that is the wise of the world, in the world's eyes, that they are vain. Their thoughts, their conclusions, their wisdom is vain. And so we understand, considering the world, if you consider that the world has wisdom, he says you are foolish and you have deceived yourself. Now, you know, the Greeks, which Corinthians were, they prided themselves on their intellect. Uh, they thought themselves as the intellectuals of the world. And humanly speaking, and when we compare them with the world, they were an educated society. You remember how Alexander the Great uh, just about conquered the world by the time he was 29. And they brought all that education into uh, the Greek Empire over which he was the king or the general. And so he says, you know, if you think the world has the answers to life, 
Then count yourself among the foolish that deceived. Just say, I, I've been foolish and I want to be wise. You've got to reject and renounce the wisdom of the world in order to know the wisdom of God. Let me give you a couple examples. The first is that the Bible is an undated book written by men. That is a very common thing among people today. They just reject the Bible. Uh, they've never sat down and studied the Bible. They never thought about the Bible. They never tried to sit down and find out who wrote it and how it was written and how it came to us. But Genesis chapter 8, or uh, Genesis, uh, Exodus chapter 8, and uh, verse 15 goes on to say that every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. It's, it was written by men, but only the Bible says in First Peter, uh, they, were, they spake by the Holy Ghost. Those men who wrote the scripture spake, and they wrote down by the Holy Ghost. So the one thing that we, you know, you can see it every day, there even some churches quit using the Bible. And it's an outdated book. They'd rather hear what the pastor says or what some famous person says. But they believe that this book that we hold in our hands and know to be the truth of God's Word and that God not only inspired the Word, but He preserved the Word of God. What good would it do if He inspired it and didn't preserve it? It would be foolish to think that God could inspire His Word and then not preserve His Word. They take liberty with the word. They, they go back and say, well, this Greek and them, you know, this Hebrew and blah, 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 and they write a new version of the Bible. God didn't preserve his book in 50 different Bibles. God preserved his book, the real book, in one book called the King James Bible for English-speaking people. i tell you another thing that the world has fostered upon us and is fostered upon our children is the thought of evolution. The very first verse uh, in the Bible, Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And John picks it up and says, in the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God and the Word was God and all things were made by Him and without Him was not anything made. What's so hard to understand about that? But when you discount the Bible and say it's just an undated book written by men, then you have a problem. The Bible says that it's evolution. Uh, that it, evolution is, is not of God. Evolution, God did not take a billion years to evolve the world. That is the most ridiculous thing in the world. If you take the history of the Bible, you'll find out that we've been around here for about 6,000 years. And they'll say, oh, no, no, no. The, uh, you know, all this proves uh, that the world is billions of years old. No, they can't prove that. That's a theory. That's why they call it the theory of evolution. And we have the fact of creation, and all the facts back it up. If you take the fossil record and find all these different fossils, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll complement creation. They, you know, they don't go back millions of years. They go back by 6,000 years. They go back to Noah's flood when the fountains of deep were broke up and the mountains collapsed and caught all those fish and all those things and they found all kind of stuff in those layers of sediment that settled. And it just simply proves that they all died at the same time over one great uh, catastrophic event and that event was the flood. A third thing that has really harmed us is their thoughts, their teaching on child discipline. Child discipline. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 22 and verse 15, Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. So God says, these children sitting over here look so innocent and everything. God said they are, uh, foolishness is bound in their heart. I know I was, and um, the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. You say, really, a rod? Yeah, rod, belt, 
um, a paddle, you know, all that will drive that stupidity out of him and give him wisdom. In Proverbs 23, 13, withhold not correction from the child. For if thou beatest him with a rod, he shall not death. He shall not die. You can beat him within a half inch of death, but he won't die. Don't kill him. But God says that's the only way to deal with children. That's the only way. Don't withhold correctness. Oh, I just couldn't spank my child. I love him too much. No, you love yourself too much. You want to put yourself through the pain of disciplining your children. I've disciplined these grandkids. And uh, when they come to my house, that, and Matt and Jeremy both know, if they get out of line, way out of line, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to discipline them. And I have. But I do it because I love them. I don't want them to grow up to be rebellious against authority, no matter who that authority is, whether it's mom and dad or grandpa and grandma or the cops or the police or uh, their teachers at school. They ought to have a respect for authority. And the only way to teach that is use the rod. Drive that foolishness that is bound in his heart. Drive it far from him with a rod of correction. Withhold not correction from the child. For if thou biddest him with a rod, he shall not die. So we considering, you know, that the world has wisdom. But when we think about it as wisdom, it's foolish and it's self-deception. Notice in verse 18, it says, Count yourself a fool. Let no man deceive himself. You're self-deceived if you think that. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. I said we're to renounce all wisdom, earthly wisdom. It's called humanism. That's the term even if it means being a called a fool by this world. Until you renounce the wisdom of the world, you never know the wisdom of God. You never seek the wisdom of God. And so many people are just satisfied with what they learned in school, what they learned in college, and they never let it, you know, they never want to be challenged about what they believe. I want to be challenged. Challenge me. I can give you scripture for what I believe. So you count yourself a fool. I have been a fool. I have believed the world. I have believed uh, it's an outdated book. I have believed evolution. I have believed that child discipline is wrong. And if you're in that situation, you're, God says you're foolish and you've got to reject that if you're really going to know the wisdom of God. You've got to get rid of this and bring in the wisdom of God, which comes through the Bible. And then notice in verse 21, exalting the glory of God. He said, Therefore let no man glory in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ." And Christ is God's. How do we glorify God? Notice how he says, let no man glory in men. But we are to glory. The Bible says, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so we're, we want to give glory to God. In the passage here, he is saying this, that if you want to glorify God, number one, you pursue the wisdom of God. I'm glad the Bible says that let any man, if any man lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all men liberally and upbraideth not. God will never get upset with you. God will never upbraid you. God will never rebuke you when you come and say, Lord, I need wisdom. I don't know what to do in this situation. I don't know what to do with this child. I, I'm, I'm trying my best, but I need the wisdom of God. And so you glorify God when you pursue his wisdom. And then you glorify God by perceiving the truth about the men of God. Think about it. He said, whether Paul or Paul is received. He's going back to those divisions in the church. And you've got to perceive that these men are, they're just men, but they're men with a gift. There's men who've been called to preach. They are men who have uh, been blessed of the Lord in many, many ways. 
Many of them have, are wonderful preachers, wonderful speakers, but we don't exalt them to the place where we exalt God. When we perceive these men, who they are, what they are, they are only they lost say the Apostle Paul, I am what I am by the grace of God. I am what I am by the grace of God. And uh, whatever that is and whatever good can come out of me is only coming because of the grace of God, that God was kind and gracious when he called me and equipped me and helped me to understand the Bible and helped me to communicate the Bible, the truth of the Word of God. And so we're to consider the world has wisdom, but it's foolishness and it's self-deception. We're to count ourselves as fools so that we can exalt the grace of God and the wisdom of God. He goes on to say we're exalting the glory of God. We're not exalting men. We're not glorying in men. We glory in God by pursuing the wisdom of God, by perceiving the men of God and who they really are. They were exalting these men. I am of Apollos. He's the greatest preacher in the world. Well, I like the Apostle Paul. He started a lot of churches. He's been written writing scriptures. And uh, I, I, I like the Apostle Paul. And others said Cephas, which is another name for Peter. I like the Apostle Peter. He's my man. He's my favorite preacher. And they were so... Um, excited about these men causing divisions in the church. Well, thank God if you have a, a, a favorite preacher. If you like Brother Wells coming and you love him and you love his preacher, thank God for it. If you like Brother Jones come over and preach, if you like Brother Randall Topping coming over and preaching, it doesn't matter. Caleb Goodman, all these men who've come and preached for us, and you say, I like this one, that's fine. You don't make a, a, a war out of it. You don't make a, an issue out of it unless you're talking about the wisdom of the world. Now look in verse 21 to 23. He says in the last part of verse 21, For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, all are yours and ye are Christ." And Christ is God. We see here the riches of the believer, the respect for the church, the retribution that God puts upon those who cause trouble, the rejection of the wisdom of this world, and then the, we call it the riches of the believer. Notice what he says, all things are yours. And he mentions uh, several things here. You see, their divisions were about personalities, about the ability to preach. And God gives to every man a different gift. Every man has a different gift and comes from God. So Paul's answer is that these men belong to all of you. You know, when a preacher comes, he, he's here to help everybody, not just you, not just because you're his favorite preacher. When they come... They come to help the church. And so he says, you're, you're divided about personalities, but listen, all things are yours. He started out saying, whether it's Paul or Paulus or Cephas, all things are yours. He is saying, the world is yours. The world that we see around us is ours. God created this world for our pleasure for our benefit. God made a wonderful world. There's nothing lacking on any planet. The planets out are, are dead. The planets are uninhabited. Uh, the planets are mostly, for the most part, uninhabitable. They don't have grand canyons. They don't have great forests. They don't have the great uh, redwood trees. They don't have all the mountains, and they don't have the waterfalls, they don't have the Niagara Falls, they are dead, but God created this earth for our joy, for our enjoyment. And he said, the world is yours. In a sense, we, we don't use this word world as being not being conformed to the world, that, that's true. 
No, we don't belong to this world. It belongs to us. It's yours. God put the world out here. He put the fields. He put the creeks. He put the mountains and the trees. And the beauty of this place, God gave it to us. And he said that's part of the riches of the believer. It is for us. Then he says life, whether life is yours. You hold the key to the enjoyment of life, the answers to life. The world, they just, um, they don't know how to enjoy life. They've never been saved. But you know how, if you're saved, you have the key to life. You have the joy of life. Jesus said, I came to give life and life more abundantly. He talked about the joy of the Lord. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you, but my peace I give unto you. My, we're, we're rich. What the, what the riches of the believers, what we're talking about. Life belongs to the children of God. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called according to his purpose. Think about that. That God said, I have given you a promise. That everything in your life, every good thing, negative thing, positive thing, uh, bad things, they all working together. Good God mixes them all together, and it comes out for our spiritual good, for our spiritual growth, that we might be made conformed unto his image. He said, death is yours. People fear death. But if you're a child of God, the Bible says in Hebrews that he has delivered us from the fear of death. He is no longer an enemy. He has become a friend that ushers us into the presence of God. We say, oh, I want to see Jesus. Well, if the rapture don't play, take place, you're going to have to die to get there. But death is not a bad thing to a child of God. Death's a good thing. It takes us into his presence. It takes us to heaven. The Bible says we are, we're, when we die, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Man, what a, what a riches is ours. And then he just sort of sums it all up. And he says, all are yours. Romans 8.30 says, I am persuaded that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing can separate us. And he mentioned things present. Whatever is going on in your life, God's in control of it. Whatever the things are to come in your life, whatever news you may hear this week, you know, we heard a couple of weeks ago about the Rife family who lost a child and a cousin on that four-wheeler accident. But for us, we say all things work together for good. We don't understand it. We won't understand it until we get to heaven. But he said none of that. None of the things that are, the things that are present, nor nothing that is to come whether it's a severe and painful sickness, whether it is death by cancer, we have no fear of death if we know the Lord. And people spend millions and millions of dollars trying to stay alive because they fear death. And uh, I told Vicky, just let me go. Just let me go. I'm ready to go home, man. I'm sick of this world and all the battles of it, and I'm looking forward to going home. He said, I'm persuaded. I'm absolutely 100% in believing that neither death, nor life, nor even angels, nor principalities and powers, that are the demon forces, not things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. I mean, God's people, we are rich. I mean, we are rich. The Bible talks about the riches of his glory, the riches that we have in Christ. We are a blessed people. If you're saved, you might say, I don't have two dimes to run together, but you're rich in spiritual things. You're rich. You can take the billionaires of the world, and you're more rich than they are. They still fear death. 
they still will spend every dime they got to stay alive another year. They, all, I mean, they fear it. They, they live in fear of losing their riches. They live in fear of the stock market going down. They live in fear. I don't live in fear. I have nothing to lose and everything to gain when I die and go to be with the Lord. Man, what a, what we're rich. Don't don't leave here <coughs> discouraged. Don't leave here and say I'm just a poor old sinner. Yeah, you're a poor old sinner saved by grace. And you have the riches of his glory available to every child of God. All things are yours. You name whatever it is, whether it's things present that we're going through right now or things to come, what we're going to go through. Listen, one thing I'm not going to go through is that great tribulation. Thank God the rapture's on the way. Thank God all the things that we see in this chaotic world and the inflation, all the things the politicians are are talking about, all the um, conspiracies that went on, all of the, the border problems and the fentanyl problems and all that stuff, it, it's of this world, but I'm not of this world. I am of God, I am of Christ, and I am rich in Him. And this is the week of Thanksgiving, and we ought to thank God and praise God that one of the things that we have, just say, I'm saved, and I have all these riches in Christ Jesus. And we can sing about the glory of God. We can sing showers of blessings. We can sing, great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father. God, listen, God is faithful to his people. He's never left, never forsake us. I mean, we are rich in the Lord Jesus Christ, and we ought to be thankful for that. Believe it. Be thankful for it. Claim it. Lord, all things are mine. You said they were, and so you just have to do that. So don't, and let me just back up to the first point. Don't disrespect the church by not being faithful, by not giving. There's a lot of ways people disrespect the church, put other things before the church. Uh, things that don't matter, things that won't make a hill of beans in the in eternity in the judgment seat of Christ. Remember that God, Christ, loved the church, and He gave Himself for it, and we ought to give ourselves to it, and say, "I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to give. I'm going to still help with missions. I'm going to put that all toward." The, the ongoing of the church, I'm going to show respect to the house of God. And unless you're sick, you ought to be here. Let's bow for prayer, please. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.